Good morning. Welcome to Horizon. My name is Ryan. If I haven't met you yet, I direct our student ministries here. So uh, I've spoken three times with the Exploring Services, um, but I heard the real party's at 8.50. So I thought I would join you all a little earlier um, just to sneak in here. Um, But I'm glad to be with you, and I do need to start with two announcements. Um, And one of them is uh, definitely sad. So if you've seen a few folks that are wearing these blue ribbons um, on our greeting team and staff, um, it's because we lost a friend of Horizon in the last week. One of the uh, deputies that has served us really well over the last few years, uh, Cayman Alexander, passed away in a car accident. And if you ever talked to Cam, as his friends called him, he was just a a great guy, really nice and um, just fun to talk to. Um, So we're we're saddened um, by his passing. It was an off-duty car accident. Um, and we're going to miss Cam and uh, encourage you to pray for his family and his friends. And I'm going to do that now um, before we move on. Um, Jesus, we thank you for uh, Cam. Thank you for his just servant's heart to be here, here at Horizon week after week, helping us not only get in and out of the parking lot safe, but also just being here to uh, protect us and just be a, a source of uh, strength in the atrium. And uh, we are going to miss him. We don't always understand what happens in life, uh, but we trust you. Pray you will comfort his family and uh, comfort his friends. In your name, amen. Thankfully, the, the second announcement is a happier one. Um, and that there's no easy way to come off of that, unfortunately. Um, but the, the other announcement that is good news is that we are moving forward um, with the video project which is a, uh, a great next step in the story of Horizon. I, I know we've been talking about it a lot, um, but the board has approved it. We've raised enough money to at least start the project. So you'll start to see some discrete changes. Um, some cameras and things will be added. Probably won't even notice them. Um, but here within a few months, we'll have the availability to live stream our services. So you could be on the West Coast for business, and you could join us here at 850 if you want to wake up really early. Um, We'll also have the availability for uh, on-demand services. So if you have a service that you really think somebody needs to hear, you can literally send them an HD quality video of that service. So we're excited about that. Um, There is still room to participate. If you would uh, like to, you could talk to uh, me, but I would probably point you to Drew or Chad or Marcus um, about that. And we do want to thank folks who have participated in that. There's been some amazing generosity out of Horizon. You, You guys are amazingly generous, so thank you for that. Um, And and today we're continuing our journey through the uh, How of Wow Living series, which has been a look at the life of Jesus in the book of Luke. Um, And it's been verse by verse. And and today we're continuing through chapter 19. So we're kind of leaving behind Zacchaeus from last week, if you remember. And we're joining Jesus and the disciples as they are on the road to Jerusalem. And we're in the last week of Jesus's life. And, And there is no way to overplay the significance of this. Because he is marching towards what will be the most monumental day in human existence. Like we as Christians, we literally believe that. That the cross is the most important day of eternity. And that's what he's heading towards. And the Bible backs that up. So if you look in the Gospels, there are 89 chapters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Of those 89 chapters, 43 of them deal with just the last seven days of the life of Christ. So almost 50% deal with just that last week, um, just one week in human existence. Of those 43, 13 of them cover just his final day. So there is, there's no way to overstate the importance of this last week and that last day. That if the birth of Christ separates our time into B.C. and A.D., the death of Christ will separate our eternities based upon what we do with that information And as this last week plays out, Jesus is going to bring the kingdom of God into more and more clarity. He's been talking about it a ton with the disciples. They're still not getting it. Um, But he's going to continue to bring clarity to that. And and today he's going to share a parable with them. And out of that parable, we're going to find three keys to kingdom living. This kingdom that he is bringing. This kingdom that he's going to fulfill. So we'll be looking at those together. But there's a, uh, an intro verse that sometimes it's tempting to just want to like skip over an intro verse. Um, but this one is really kind of power packed. So we're going to start here in uh, Luke 19 verse 11 <clears throat> before we jump into the full parable. And it says this. It says, now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought 
the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So here in verse 11, the words, these things, like what are they talking about? Like sometimes I think we think Jesus was like a robot, right? And he didn't really talk to people. But, you know, if you're walking on the road with your friends, you're going to talk. And they had literally just left Zacchaeus where Jesus had just proclaimed, hey, salvation has come to this household today. So I bet you they're talking about Zacchaeus. And I would think they're saying, who in the world would have thought that the kingdom of God was for a guy like Zacchaeus, right? Like Zacchaeus was the Bernie Madoff of Jericho, right? Like he was hated. He had swindled people. He was a crook. And the kingdom was for him? I I think what Jesus was teaching through that for them and for us is that this new kingdom was going to be for every man and every woman should they repent. Whether they look like it's for them or whether they look like the furthest off guy like Zacchaeus, it was going to be for them. Also here in verse 11, it says that as they're nearing Jerusalem, Jesus is prompted to share this parable. Um, And you have to think through, well, what is special about Jerusalem that prompts him to do that? Well, one thing is they're heading towards Jerusalem for the Passover, which was always just a a festive time um, in the Jewish culture. Uh, the other reason is that Jesus has been hinting now for quite a while that something is about to go down in Jerusalem. In fact, he's told them quite plainly what's about to go down in Jerusalem, but they're just still not quite getting it. And honestly, around Jesus, this hype has been building. Um, People have watched him do amazing things, like raise someone from the dead, like heal ten lepers that nobody would even touch or talk to, heal a man born blind, I could go on and on. They've watched these amazing, crazy things happen, and this energy is just building around Jesus. Almost like if you've seen some political campaigns where a a little-known politician goes from being a state senator to maybe a presidential, maybe to a presidential forerunner to all of a sudden they're our president, right? And, And that is what's happening with Jesus. There's this ball of energy approaching Jerusalem. And the people around him, though, they they're not quite getting it right because they are hoping in a kingdom that he's not really talking about. They're hoping in a kingdom that's temporary, right? They really want Jesus just to overthrow the Romans. (laughs) That's their whole hope. Jesus, overthrow the Romans so that we can have our own Jewish kingdom our way. And oh, by the way, we want it immediately there in verse 11. They, like me, are microwave men and women. Like a 40-second microwave burrito is just too long, right? Like you want that in 30 seconds. You know, like five-minute abs should be four-minute abs. Or just give me abs, right? Like that's, that's the society I live in. Um, and they lived in too. I pray that every day and it's still not working. Um, so, so they are hoping in a temporary kingdom. And, it, and it's a good dream, a noble dream for freedom and liberty. I, I think God wants us to live that way. Um, But it wasn't a dream that could impact eternity. And the kingdom Jesus was talking about was an eternal kingdom. Because what we know history teaches us is that if he would have just overthrown the Romans, that eventually another nation would have come along and just overthrown the Jewish empire again. And and that's going to bring us to our first key to the kingdom today. And that is that we are called to tear down your sandcastles. What do I mean by that? Tear down your sandcastles. Well, they were building, or trying to build, hoping to build, a a kingdom that was very temporary. Like we are heading to the beach here in about four days, not that I'm counting, um, for for us till spring break. And I'm excited about that. But my kids will build sandcastles, and they will last about two hours, right, before the the waves get them or somebody steps on them. Um, They're very temporary. So tear down your sandcastles. For a few years, Becky and I lived in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And in Myrtle Beach, you have lots of things like drunk people and tourists and all kinds of stuff. But you, you also have a lot of sand. Okay, there's lots of sand in Myrtle Beach. It gets in your clothes, your hair, your shoes. Um, and from time to time, they would do a uh, sandcastle building contest. So I, think, I don't know if we can pop that up there. Um, maybe not, but okay. So there it is. So while we were there, they had a... Uh, world's largest sandcastle building contest. And and that thing was over 50 feet tall. So just imagine it's here on stage with us. It's magnificent. Um, When they first built it, it was protected. It made the news, some national news. Um, It was very, you know, very swanky. Um, And for a while, it was pretty neat. Uh, But then what happened is the birds found it, right? Because for the birds, it was just a 50-foot perch. So the sandcastle started to take on some interesting colors. Um... (laughs) 
pretty quickly the wind and the waves started hitting, or not the waves, but the wind and the rain started hitting it. So it started to kind of get rounded edges and pitted um, walls. And, and before you knew it, they weren't even guarding it. So then at, the tourists at night were kind of climbing on it. Um, cool place to look at the stars. And, you know, the homeless people found it, the cats found it. And before you knew it, you looked over, and instead of a 50-foot glowing, beautiful thing, it was like a 20-foot ashtray. <laughs> This is what it looked like. It was just this heap of dirty sand, and really it became kind of like an eyesore that they had to just clean up. And when I think about that, I think of the sandcastle kingdoms that, like, I build in my life. They're, they're initially really cool, and maybe sometimes in a week or so they start to crumble, or maybe sometimes it takes years to decades. But eventually they're temporary, and they're not going to stand the test of time. So right out of the gate, I think this um, scripture is asking us the question of, hey, Ryan, what kingdom are you putting your hope in? Are you putting your hope in like a sandcastle kingdom? You know, the kingdom of Ryan, where the, the good life comes from maybe another zero on your paycheck, another bedroom on your house, a, a faster car, some, some nicer abs. Um, or are you putting your hope in the kingdom of God? Where the, the good life comes from trusting in a good, good father, like Neil and the team just sang about. And, and putting your hope into that, because that is eternal. Far too often, I think I hope in far too low of a sandcastle kingdom. So by now, as we continue on the road with the disciples and Jesus, I think Jesus is getting a little frustrated. Because as Chad shared a few weeks ago and did this um, really bad Bush impersonation, um, you know, he's told them over and over again that he's going to Jerusalem to be taken by the Gentiles, beaten, tortured, killed, and he's going to rise again on the third day. And it's almost like they're hearing that, and they're just, they're saying, okay, so we're going there, and we're just going to, like, kick the Romans' butts, and then we're all going to rule, right? Like, that's what's going to happen, Jesus. And, and you can see him doing this, like, face palm thing, and he's like, okay, I'm going to explain this to you guys one more time. You know, maybe like I do with our three-year-old, where you're trying to tell him in the fifth way how something's going to happen. Um, Jesus is going to do that today through this parable. And this parable is going to be awesome. It's a, a little lesser-known parable because it's very similar to a parable of the talents, which we've heard a lot. Um, but this one isn't as known. It's called the parable of the minas. So because of that, I'm going to read the first half of the parable. We'll just read to give you kind of the, the whole story um, before we dive into a verse-by-verse -verse exploration. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's uh, verses 12 through 27. It said, Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said, you also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. So you have this nobleman who has to go to a faraway country to receive a kingdom. And, and he has these people that don't like him, that follow him, uh, shouting, we do not want you to reign over us. And then you have these servants who are each giving, giving a mina to uh, do business with till he comes. That, that's kind of the story. There's obviously a, a, a finish to that also that I'm, I'm saving to bring around the corner here in the end. Uh, but let's jump in and look at this verse by verse. So Luke 19, 12, it says, uh, Therefore he said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return. 
When you read those words, a certain nobleman went to a far country, it, it sort of sounds like a uh, fairy tale, right? Or, or maybe the beginning of like a Star Wars movie. Um, but what's really cool in this, and, and I had, had no idea about this, but um, this is the only parable Jesus tells that is historic in nature, that it's based on actual events. That in their lifetime, there had been a leader named Herod Archelaus. And Archelaus was the son of Herod the Great, who tried to exterminate Jesus and all the male children in Jerusalem under a certain age. And and there's a picture of him, uh, or his bust, I should say. Uh, And as Herod the Great was approaching the end of his life, he started to dole out leadership of his kingdom to his children. And Herod Archelaus received Jerusalem and Jericho. And he was a brutal and violent leader. There's an account by Josephus that Archelaus put a golden eagle at the front of the temple, which has nothing to do with the religious, uh, the Jewish religion. So the priest moved it out of the way, and Archelaus, in retribution, sent his troops, and they slaughtered 300 men, women, and children that day in the temple. So he was not popular, to say the least. And unfortunately for Archelaus, when his father passes away, Herod the Great, Archelaus has to make a long journey to Rome to get approval from the emperor to now become king, to get the stamp of approval from the emperor. You seeing the implications here, how they're the same? As Archelaus begins that journey, Josephus tells us that 50 men from Jericho follow him, shouting, you will not reign over us, and giving the laments of all the evil things he had done. And we can only imagine Archelaus doesn't kill them all right away because he just doesn't want more baggage to have to explain to the emperor. So pretty cool. It's a parable based on history. Um, The other thing to know is that Archelaus is mentioned in the Bible. So that was from a historian. But in the Bible, when uh, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Egypt to hide him from Herod the Great, um, at some point Joseph has a dream where he's told to return to Judea. Now let's pick up here in Matthew 2.22. It says, But when he heard, this is Joseph, when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So just kind of a cool side point here that like God is just sort of showing off here, like calling his own shot, that there's this prophecy that's hundreds of years old, that Jesus is going to be a Nazarene. And he uses this terrible leader, Herod Archelaus, this evil man, to influence Jesus towards that prophecy. Like that's just kind of cool. When I found that out, I was like, man, God is awesome. Like he is so in control. He uses even this evil man, Archelaus, to put Jesus where he needs to be to fulfill a prophecy that was hundreds of years old. Pretty cool stuff. Um, But let's continue here in the parable. 13, he calls 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, do business till I come. Well, a few things here. Uh, A mina, if you're unfamiliar with that, it's a, you know, it's a a small amount of money um, in that culture. So a talent from the other parables, a large amount of money. A mina is one-sixtieth of a talent. So it's a far smaller amount of money. And that'll certainly play into why Jesus, um, there'll be some reasons why Jesus picks just a mina. Uh, The second thing he tells them here in verse 13 is to do business till I come. And when you go to the original Greek, this do business is an active and ongoing phrase. It's not, hey, take this, invest it once, take this, bury it. It is this, hey, represent me in an ongoing fashion until I return. That's sort of what's going on. Also in 13 here, you'll see that there's 10 servants and 10 minas. So unlike the parable of the talents where they each get varying amounts, in this one, they each get the very same amount of money to invest, to do business with. And that's going to bring us to our second key to the kingdom, which is to sail your mina. And this is a little bit of a play on words. So who remembers Christopher Columbus? What were his boats named? The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, right? I wish he would have called it the mina, but he didn't. Um, So we're going with a little play on words here. I know it's really the Nina, but we're going to say, hey, sail your mina. 
that in the same way all three of those boats have the chance to get across the ocean, um, all of us are given a few things that are minas that we all get. So in the parable of the talents, there's different talents in a different way, because talents is a money, but it's also a thing. Um, there's different talents that we all have. But mina-wise, think about it. Today is April the 7th, 2019, and we are all going to get 24 hours to use. We all get the same mina, whether you're sitting here in your 50 or you're sitting here in your 10. You get that same mina of 24 hours. Or, or we all get the same mina of the Holy Spirit. That sometimes I think we think like, you know, there's a professional Holy Spirit that guys like maybe Chad have, you know, and then, you know, maybe Drew gets like the, you know, the junior college Holy Spirit. And, you know, like I've got like the rec league, you know, third grader Holy Spirit. Um, well, that's just not true that we, we all get the 100 proof, full strength Holy Spirit out of the gate when we commit our lives to Christ. And the last mina that I think of is that we all have the same call on our lives to love God and to love people. We all have that same call. And we're called to sail our mina. Use that thing. Sometimes, though, when it it comes to sailing, it's safer to stay at the dock, right? There's less risk. And in verse 14, it says that his citizens hated him. So the nobleman's going away and his citizens hate him. So imagine you're these ten servants, the three that we will look at. Um, You're being asked to do business in the name of a nobleman who is hated. (laughs) That's going to require some risk, right? You're walking up to do business and you're like, oh yeah, I'm doing business for Bob, the guy you guys all hate. You're not going to be popular. I don't know if you guys have ever had a job like that where people weren't exactly excited to see you um, when you walked up. Maybe you're like a bailsman or bondsman or something. I don't know. Um, parole officer. Uh, but in college, I answered a, uh, a newspaper ad because the internet didn't exist. And it was for a uh, can't-miss opportunity, which is also called a scam, right? <laughs> um, so I show up, and there's some other, you know, people like me. And, and for about an hour, they don't even tell us what we're doing, which is always a red flag. Um, but... After a while, it comes out that, hey, this is door-to-door sales. So I'm like, okay, some people have raised families on door-to-door sales. That's not bad initially. Um, and they're like, but it's, uh, it's perfume and cologne. So I'm like, oh, oh okay. You know. and, and then I learned that it's generic knockoff perfume and cologne. Okay? Um, so not, not really excited about this, but at the time I was about 20, so I was just like, I'm up for it. You know, so I go and I go with the president of the company in quotation marks. He's like 25 and we're going door to door. And and so you walk up to the first door, you know, and a guy answers, you know, like, hello, sir, can I interest you in some rugby? Smells just like polo, but it comes in this convenient cardboard case, you know, and it's like doors are slammed in your face and you go to the next door. You know, hello, ma'am, could I interest you in some Chanel number six? (laughs) You know, as implied, it is one better than Chanel number five, right? You know, like doors are just being slammed in our faces. Um, I never went back. But there's something cool about being willing to risk like that, that in college we just do easier, where it's like, yeah, sure, I'll go try to sell cologne door to door. Um... And I'm not implying that we should do that with our faith, that we need to become door-to-door, you know, knock-off Bible salesmen or something. But what I do think this is asking us is, hey, when is the last time that you took a risk in your faith? Like, when is the last time you took the boat out of the docks, you know? When is the last time you left the marina with your mina? I could have used that too, that rhymes. Um, Maybe it's like, hey, I'm going to start coming to a men or women's Bible study here at Horizon. Like that, that takes a risk to, to talk to other people about the Bible in your life. It takes a little bit of a risk there. Maybe it's to uh, head down with us to Happy Church in Southern Kentucky and, and love on some of the poorest of the poor families and children. Maybe it's to head to Belize with us, with one of our partner organizations. There's so many ways to risk for the kingdom of God. When's the last time that you you jumped out there and set sail? There's a great quote that I I want you to see here. Um, It is, a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are made for. Or ships are built for. 
that God is saying, hey, you, there's times in your faith where you're going to need a harbor. You're going to need to be safe and comfortable. But there's other times where I built you to be at sea, right? To be just crashing against the waves. And, and that brings us to our third key, which is kingdom key, which is multiply your mina. And as we look at the servants and they're coming back, there's going to be some great stuff that comes out of this. And there'll be three truths that come out of this last key. Uh, that a lot of faithfulness is going to lead to authority and rule in the future. So verse 15, we're going to pick up where the first servant says, And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these ten servants to whom he had given the money to be called, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So in verse 15, that when he returned, like you think about that for these servants, those three words had to evoke either one of two emotions, either sheer terror, like, oh no, he's back, (laughs) we're in trouble, or sheer joy, like, oh my goodness, he's finally home, we've been waiting. And as I've walked with relatives and others through their end of life, that feels like the two emotions that I see sometimes, just sheer terror, like, oh, I've got to meet my maker, or sheer joy, like, thank you, it is about time to come home. Um, But he's coming back, and the nobleman comes back in the parable, And what I would say, if we look at this parable through the lens of 2019, we are living between verses 14 and 15. In verse 14, the nobleman is still off in the far country. We're still being asked to do business in his name. And in verse 15, he comes back. Right? We're in the messy middle right now of this parable. And and what we do with Armina doesn't have an impact on our eternity. That comes through faith in Christ alone. But it does have an impact on our rewards and our future in heaven and the people around us. So it certainly has an impact. It certainly is important. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. So you can imagine this first servant, like when the master's coming, he is like the kid who remembered homework is due in school. And he's like, hey, over here, master, woo, look at me. You know, because he has 10 minas. He knows he's done well. Um, And the master says, hey, great job. You turned one mina into 10. That's a lot of multiplication. Good job. You know, and if you think about it, really, he turned one mina into 10 cities, right? Like one mina to 10 minas to 10. Ten cities. Really, this is a parable about the goodness of the nobleman, that he would bless this guy with just a tiny bit of faithfulness with ten cities. And really, if you look here in verse uh, 16, it says, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. Now, really, this first servant has been playing with house money, right? Like, it wasn't even his mina. Have you ever played a game with house money? I remember in junior high going to Neil Berger's house there in Madeira. And uh, his dad played cards with his buddies. So they would give us like $10 in chips, you know, just to join in to kind of bolster the numbers. Um, And it wasn't my money. So it was house money. So I was like a riverboat gambler. You know what I mean? Like I have like a two and an eight. And I'm like, I'm in. You know, because it just wasn't my money. You play freer when you're playing with house money. And that's what this servant is doing. And it's interesting, um, the words that the master chooses. He says, you are faithful in a very little. And if you think about that there in verse 17, that could feel demeaning, right? Like, hey, I worked really hard to turn that one mean into ten. But I think there's a reason Jesus chose a mina when he tells this parable instead of a talent, which is a lot of money. He's saying, hey, I see what you do with the very little, the ways that you're faithful with the very little. I see that, and I'm going to bless that. And that is good news. Because sometimes the very little things add up, right? I don't know if you've ever walked with an aging parent or a a sick relative, and there's a whole lot of very little um, in that relationship. There's a whole lot of very little doctor appointments that that always pop up and and feel inconvenient. And you you go with a smile on your face. And, And there's a whole lot of very little times where you hold a hand and you hear news that's not exciting And you don't have words to say. There's a whole lot of very littles there. And God is saying, hey, I see those. I see those very littles. And I'm going to bless the ways you're faithful. 
Or some of us here have young kids and you get to the end of a day and you just, you would love to talk to your spouse or stare at a wall blankly or anything, but you are so exhausted, you just put your head on the pillow because it's been a day of very littles. Very little noses wiped and other things wiped. Um, Very little jobs to do. Very little lawns to cut. Very little homeworks to help with and temper tantrums to lovingly endure. And God is saying through this parable, hey, I see those. I see those very little ways you're faithful. And I'm going to bless you for them. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said, you also be over five cities. I almost get this Oprah moment where it's like, you get a city, you get a city, you get a city. You know, or she's giving away cars like crazy. That this master is generous and good. I like to say he is 10 cities good, right? He, for his own mina, if you're faithful with it, he's going to bless you with 10 cities. He is 10 cities good. I think he's giving them a trial run in faithfulness. I'm going to give you this very little mina. And if you're faithful with it, I'm going to give you a lot of authority and responsibility. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. (laughs) All right, like talk about awkward. He like pulls his handkerchief out and he's like, hey, here's your mina. (laughs) You know, like this gives me lots of questions. Like, did he forget? Like, was he so busy building his own sandcastles that he forgot he was supposed to be investing this mina? Um, Was he fearful? Like, hey, this is unpopular. This this guy, nobody likes him. This is going to be hard. Or was he just lazy? Like, was it just easier not to do it? There's a great quote that I came across that haunts me. Um, And it says, I would never want to reach out someday with a soft, uncalloused hand a hand never dirtied by serving, and shake the nail-pierced hand of Jesus. Whew, man. But let's see what he says. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. So he goes in and he tells his boss, he says, hey, you're austere. You're cheap. You're tight. You're frugal. And some of us are like, yeah, that's a compliment. Thanks. I'm good with my money. (laughs) You know, but then he doubles down and he says, you're also a crook. You reap where you don't sow. And this raises lots of questions too. Like I don't go into my boss's office and say that, hey, you're cheap and you're a crook, right? Um, Not good for job security. But before I judge this guy too quickly, Maybe he is just brave enough to say the things that I sometimes think. That I look up and I say, hey, God, you are, you're kind of austere. You're kind of a tightwad here. Like, I need a little more money. Or I need a little more happiness in my life. Or I deserve a little more happiness in my life. Or, or I need a little more health in my life right now, God. Like, you're, you're holding back on me. Or, or there certainly have been times where I looked up at God and I've said, hey, you're a crook. Like, you've stolen this relationship from me. Like, this was not supposed to end. What happened? Or you've stolen this person from me who's not with us anymore. Or you've stolen this career from me. So before I'm too quick to judge, I've got to think through that sometimes I do that. That I say, hey, God, you're you're a tightwad and you're a crook. Or I can look up and I can say, hey, God, you are ten cities good. That when I really look back at my life and I think of the ways that I've just been faithful in tiny little ways, man, you have blessed me. That you have been ten cities good. You have blessed the socks off of me. But let's see how the master responds. So this is, you know, the servant comes up. He gives his lame excuse that it's in his handkerchief. And we'll see how the master responds here. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. He holds nothing back. Um, You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. The master continued, For I say to you that everyone who has will be given, 
And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. You know, in this trial run that these servants are put on, the stakes are actually pretty high, aren't they? That, that from this house money Mina that wasn't even his, that he didn't invest, he gains nothing. He loses it all. Man, that, that's, the stakes are high. And as I was studying for this, it reminded me of another character out of a parable Jesus told. So we're all really familiar probably with the parable of the prodigal son. So you have the young son that goes away, distant country, spends half the family's money on wild living. He comes home, father welcomes him, and the father is throwing a banquet where they've killed the fatted calf, and it's a party. But there's another brother, right? There's an older brother. In Luke 15, 28 through 29, But he was angry, the older brother, and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. He's saying, hey, you're cheap. You never even gave me a goat. You know, you gave little Billy here the fatted calf, and you're, you're not even giving me this ugly goat. Like, you're, you're holding out on me, Dad. And oh, by the way, you've robbed me. I've never gotten to make merry with my friends. I've never gotten to have these parties, you know? It's a tale as old as time. God, you're, you're cheap, and you're, you're robbing me. And, and you can imagine the dad pulls him close. And he says to him, he says, in 31, he says, Son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. He says, hey, forget about the goat. Forget about the little party. Like, you've always had it all. Like, I'm ten cities good. Like, you've had it all, all the time. Will you trust me that I'm not holding out on you? (laughs) Will you trust me that I'm not robbing you, that I have your best in mind? I think those are the questions God's asking me. And we need to finish the parable (laughs) <laughs> which sometimes isn't fun because there's, there's some rough verses in Scripture. But they're good. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. It's like, yikes! You know, if Jesus had like a PR guy, he'd be like, hey, Jesus, you know, ixe on the slayne stuff here. Like, <laughs> you know, um, you might want to retool that sentence, you know. But man, is it, it's true. And when you think about this, God only gives people what they ask for. That these were the enemies saying, hey, we do not want you to reign over us, shaking their fist into the face of the nobleman. Like, we don't want your rule. These are the older brothers saying, hey, we don't want to join your party. It looks fun and all, but thanks, but no thanks. And in the end, God just gives them that. He says, okay, if you don't want to be a part of my party, I'm not going to make you. And I think as we finish this parable here, I think we've got to ask ourselves the question, like, where am I in the parable? Well, you're not the nobleman. That's God. Sorry if you're open for that one. Um, Are you a a faithful servant? You're taking that mina, and you're doing your best to multiply it for a a ten-city good God. Are you an unfaithful servant where you're on the beach, and you're just building your own sandcastles? And man, they look nice for now. Or maybe you're still kind of just shaking your fist at God, saying, hey, you're not going to rule over me. Like, this is still my life, God. I think where we stand in this parable answers a lot of questions about our life and our faith. So I'd encourage you to think through that. I'm going to pray to end our time, and then I'll have a few closing thoughts. Jesus, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word. That just a simple parable about a master and servants and a mina has so much depth, so much wisdom that you want to give us. Help us to have a hunger and thirst to read your word and to learn. Pray that you would help us to be faithful with our minas, that the lives that you've given us each, that you'd help us to faithfully try to multiply them, to to sail them and to take risks, to tear down our own personal sandcastles, to be a part of your permanent eternal kingdom. We love you, and in your name, Jesus, amen. Hey, so Easter is coming up, in case you've been living in a cave. Um, So here at Horizon, we do Easter really well. So there'll be seven identical services um, over the weekend of the 20th and the 21st. 
So on Saturday, there are services at 3, 4, and 5. If you have children, we do an awesome Easter egg hunt slash Easter egg drop where we drop thousands of Easter eggs out of a helicopter. Um, Those hunts are at 3.30 and 4.30. And if you have little ones like walkers to two-year-olds, we do have a little separate area so they don't get stampeded. Um, And also for three and four-year-olds. So the walkers and twos, it's green. Three and four-year-olds, it's pink. We'll have lots of signs. On Sunday, actually Easter Sunday, we have four services 8.50, 10.00, 11.10, 8.50, 10, 11.10, and 12.20. And, and just due to seating and wanting everybody to have an amazing experience, we do ticket these events, um, but it is complimentary. So you'd want to grab tickets for either the services or the egg drops in the atrium in the back there. So I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all again for being here.